So let's um, let me get things perking along here. Uh, okay, let's share my screen, and I want to grab that. And let's see the slideshow. Okay, everybody uh, can see the uh, big old honking slide up there. Yeah, we're looking good. Okay, so we're going to be talking about time and uh, all the things that it um, what it means to us. So, you know, I like to throw in a little bit of history, but this is going to be really, really simple stuff. I'm, there is so much history on time that uh, it's really, really fascinating. But I'm only going to hit some highlights here. So how do we measure time? A little bit about uh, NIST. Uh, that's a government agency that helps us stay uh, synchronized on time. They uh, run the uh, WWV uh, part. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about the difference between WWV and uh, some of its derivatives. Uh, some information about atomic clocks and why do we use UTC, U, um, UCT, GMT, and I don't remember, there's probably a few more acronyms in there. Oh yeah, Zulu time. We're gonna talk about Zulu time. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what all this kind of means for our ham radio operators. So history, Galileo back in between the um, uh, 1500s and 1600s, he probably had the most significant uh, contribution on how we use time and what time means in his, in our current history. So he was an incredibly clever um, a physics guy and incredibly uh, knowledgeable on math. So he brought to life real understanding. At that point in time, all people really worried about it was what, what, what hour were we in? And it was a really crude way of figuring out what hour it was. But he brought the refinement to come up with what the heck a minute and what a second stood for. And this information actually got translated into a lot of our positioning systems on how we end up carving up our Earth as far as longitude and latitude. Really important discovery. Um, but a lot of this didn't really come to um fruition or as far as being coming into practical use uh, for at least another couple hundred years when we started doing more uh, navigation of the earth so he's the guy that came up with all the mathematics and the need for time on how we ended up calculating longitude we knew where things were latitude going north and south but longitude going east and west, we did, really didn't have a good clue on how to divide that up. So he came up with a math that allowed uh, ships to navigate uh, the earth. Um, so yeah, that third bullet there, knowing the uh, correct time was critical for navigating the, uh, uh, the earth. So that also brought into a concept called a uh, chronometer. Basically, it was a clock that had some level of accuracy. So with that accuracy, then you were able to take and figure out where you were in the whole earth. Now, that was the X prize of the day. There was a big reward out uh, in Britain for whoever could come up with a workable chronometer that would work at sea. Right. That, that, that was the um, holy grail. And, and once that chronometer got invented, then it became an issue about how they synchronized. Where was the points, point source of how you synchronized all these clocks and how it got carried forward. Now, when you got into the 1900s, when shipping really got uh, going and also radio got going, it was really important to have a radio on board your ship so you could listen for radio stations because at the top of the hour, they would broadcast what the current time was. And you could use that time to synchronize your chronometer for 
figuring out where you were in the in the darn world. I used to so, wind I used to wind three of those suckers every day at noon. Oh really? Yeah. I, wow. I was the I was the navigator on a uh, navy vessel, and uh, we had three chronometers that we had to uh, wind at the same time every day and compare them. And you kept a log of the time that each one of them uh, was off from each other. So even if you didn't have radio communications, uh, by comparing the drift of the three chronometers, you could come up with an accurate time for celestial nav. Far out, far out. But, but the overall synchronizing to them, that required RF communication, I assume. Well, before that, before <laughs> that, you had dropping the ball. Yeah. When you would come into a port and anchor in a, uh, in a uh, built up port, the local authorities would hoist the ball on top of a uh, flagpole. And it, precisely at noon, they would haul it down rapidly. And so that's where the term uh, dropping the ball came from. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Okay, I, I I did not know that one. That's that's one that uh, kind of surprised me. Yeah, there's still one of those in operation uh, in the uh, port uh, just outside of Christchurch, New Zealand. I've wow. actually visited. Huh. huh, that's cool. Well, nowadays we have atomic clocks and that uh, provides a reference with insane amount of accuracy and that's what the world uses these days to try and synchronize clocks so that atomic clock that the nis um, t operates that information gets distributed around the world through wwv which we'll talk more about gps systems and a network protocol that we use on the internet called NTP. So there's lots of different ways that everything stays synchronized around the world. So time is often described as the fourth dimension. And we'll get into, uh, I have something kind of at the very end of this that'll kind of twist your head a little bit to get you to think about what, uh, what this other dimension might be. Actually, uh, and if you go back in history, uh, the church was very involved with time. And there were a lot of things that uh, the monks used to keep time. And there was a lot of practices and a lot of things that the church sponsored on trying to do a better job of keeping time. So uh, how do we measure time? Uh, well, we usually we, with a device called a clock. Now that clock can take off on a lot of different kinds of things. Uh, clocks back in the old days used to be sundials. There's uh, water clocks that um, spend a lot of time um, clear back in the Roman days on trying to keep accurate time. And that was basically a drip of water. Uh, later on, they, like especially the Germans, and uh, came up with some better ideas on mechanical clocks. Um, nowadays, we uh, are using uh, electronic clocks. So we have a bunch of little silicon in there that, uh, and little crystals that oscillate at a certain rate and that uh, keeps track of our time using um, electronics. And then we also have the atomic clock, which is that's the uh, holy grail of, of how time gets kept. So, um, so today the most accurate clock that we that the world relies on is this atomic clock. It's the most accurate thing that we have. So here's a picture. This is the breadboard of one of the original atomic clocks. So this is what how complicated something like that use uh, that, that that what it looks like. Now they were able to refine this um, breadboard into something that looks like this. So this is what a natural commercial atomic clock is that the uh, NIST or NITS uh, actually used to 
um, broadcast or to collect information to synchronize their clock that they use to let everybody else in the world knows what, to know what time it is. <coughs> so atomic clock. Today's atomic clock will lose one second over 10 million years. That's how stinking accurate that thing. The definition of one second is the time it takes for a cesium atom to oscillate 9 billion 192,631,077 times in one second. I don't know how they keep track of how that little electron zings around that cesium atom. But mm -hmm. anyway, that's, that's what that little um, breadboard did there, was did all the calculations and keep, keep track of that cesium atom and watching that electron uh, zing around uh, the nucleus there. Um, so the interesting thing is that you think, well, gee whiz, that's pretty darn accurate, uh, one second over 10 million years. But the, uh, the guys there at the laboratory, they're continuing to try and improve and they actually have some breadboard stuff that's all put together uh, for improving that uh, accuracy quite significantly. So from that precise tick every second, we then can derive minutes, hours, and days, and so on. But basically, it, it all gets derived from that one second out there. So let's talk a little bit about WWV. That's um, a uh, whole bunch of transmitters uh, that the that is operated by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, called the NIST. Uh, they broadcast from Fort Collins in Colorado. There's also a site in Hawaii. They've been broadcasting from Fort Collins since 1990. Since 1990. They transmit on uh, the 2.5, 5 megahertz, 10 megahertz, 20 megahertz, and, and 25 megahertz. WWV uh, sends out a tick every one second, a beep on every minute, and a voice announcement every hour. And then there's a bunch of other stuff that gets mixed in along with that, but that's the crutches of, of what they end up sending out. So. It's really nice if you know, you're trying to take and figure out um, what time of the day is, you can actually tune up on one of these five frequencies there, actually six frequencies, and you can listen to that and you can figure out what the minute is and you can figure out what happens every hour. And so it's pretty neat listening to all that stuff. Yeah, and there are uh, stations in Asia which also send out a time tick on those exact same frequencies. So if you, uh, once you're out in the middle of the Pacific and start heading west from there, you start losing WWVH and start picking up these Chinese uh, time stations. <laughs> Interesting. So back before uh, everybody had radios, um, interesting, and I remember this as a kid, you, they actually have a phone service. So you can call that 303-4999-7111 uh, 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 number, and that'll connect you to the, the uh, N NIST, and it will tell you what time it is. And so I remember doing that as a kid, calling that number and using that uh, to set all the clocks in the house. That was a very, uh, very nice thing to do. So there's also a service called WWVB. So that operates on low frequency at 600 kilohertz. And it transmits, it doesn't send out the voice announcements, but sends out the t all the time codes. And uh, it is used by typically our clocks. Like if we have a clock that's on the wall, that's a, a um, um, atomic clock, or at least it has a little symbol on that that will synchronize to WWV, which is really nice because all you have to do is set what time zone you, you're in, and it will also do adjustments between daylight savings time. 
So every night it usually picks up um, that WWB signal and synchronizes the clock. And actually over for time I have been replacing more and more of my clocks in the house with atomic clocks. So when we go between daylight savings time and not daylight savings time, it automatically does that adjustment for me. I've got a little clock that I got that does that. It's a small one and it projects the time up on the ceiling. So if you're in bed, you can look up the ceiling and see the time. Yep. And it co coordinates with that broadcast of time. Yep. You can get wristwatches that uh, listen to that signal as well. Yeah, I have one. And they're, they're really nice to have. I mean, I, I like having the atomic clock, so I don't have to worry about drift or anything. I know that they're spot on. So the time that um, uh, WWV sends out, that's UTC time or GMT, Greenwich Mean Time. So it's all based on um, the Greenwich Mean Time. It's not local time. So you have to make your own adjustments between what WWV sends out and what your local time offset is. There's another set of uh, uh, WWV lookalikes out there called WWVH that's in Hawaii. So you'll notice on voice announcements um, for everything from Fort Collins that uses a male, vo male voice. For WWVH that uses a female voice. There is a whole set of, of standards out there that you can read through on how they interlace the information that comes from these different uh, references or different locations for uh, WWV. It's quite interesting, uh, but you gotta be a techie guy to wander through that stuff to figure out how, uh, how what it means as far as what they inter how they interlace that information. Interesting thing there at Fort Collins there for WWV, they have 11 backup transmitters and they have a, another whole host of other backup systems. So you, it's, it's, it's one of those things that it's, it's, it will be there until a nuclear explosion destroys it. It just will be there as a rock. Yeah, uh, the uh, trans the antennas for WWV in Fort Collins are uh, readily visible from uh, Interstate 25. If you're uh, driving by at night, you can see the clearance lights on those mm -hmm. antennas. Yeah. Uh, didn't didn't the previous guy uh, in in the White House didn't he try to show, weren't they planning to shut down WWV? Yep, I had nothing to do with the president. It was. Uh, they, they kind of figured that everybody is using the internet to get their time now. And so uh, they figured it might've been a, um, a, uh, a redundancy that they didn't need to pay for, but uh, they actually turned that around uh, while Trump was still president. Mm -hmm. Now I might shut it down in the next year or two, but for now it's still running. It, it seems like something that just, it's a staple. I, I just can't see them ever set, turning it down. But No, me neither. That's well, you know, I used to think that uh, the Coast Guard listening on 2182 uh, kilohertz, or even before that, uh, all the ships listening up on 500 kilohertz for distress signals would never go away. Fool me. Mm -hmm. Those are all gone. Wow. Well, things change, and sure enough, this uh, the WWV service may uh, disappear, but the national time standard, they'll still be using their cesium or some version of that um, uh, atomic clock, and that information will still be used to synchronize things through the internet and other, other ways. Well, my atomic clocks uh, all use WWV. So let's talk about uh, daylight savings time. So that uh, the, the interesting thing is that for, you have to remember WWV is centric to the US. It is, does not consider anything outside of the US. So we have a concept in the US on when we switch between daylight savings time and non-daylight savings time. That little bar down at the bottom where it tells about the time code format. So in that format, 
things are, are encoded in there for when we go into and out of daylight savings time. It, um, let's see, um, anyway, it handles all the daylight same time. It also handles, if we ha come up with leap seconds, we have to adjust our clock because of a leap second. It has the ability to do this. Um, so anyway, they, they, there's a whole, if, like I mentioned, that bottom um, uh, bullet there represents, um, there's some, some really interesting standards out there if you want to read through it and see how all of this stuff has worked and how it's supposed to communicate with everybody. So why does WWV matter? So the interesting thing is RF travels at the speed of light. So if you're trying to synchronize a clock, it's going to be pretty much right on. You don't have to do any finessing of it because, uh, because of how fast electronics or how fast RF travels. If you try and synchronize your <clears throat> clocks through the internet, you have time delays, you have uh, other things that go on and how that time propagates through the system. So there's a bunch of other complexities when you try and internet or synchronize a clock through the internet. Um, high speed trading and banking over fiber optics uh, incur horrible delays. And there is still is there still is nothing that beats terrestrial radio for time synchronization because that just travels so fast. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about once we get outside of uh, what happens in our own little, around our little world here in a bit. Okay, calibration of, for engineers, test equipment, atomic clock accuracy uh, keeps our everyday world in sync. And so what comes out of that WWV, there is a lot of instruments, a lot of things that still use that for proper synchronization and calibration. For ham radio, uh, logging on FT8 and propagation, um, it, it, we, we, we tend, tend to use what WWV ends up uh, producing there. Okay, another neat thing is that we know that we've kind of learned over the last four years that things can be spoofed. And when it comes to WWV, you just can't fake it. That's as accurate as a time and you're not going to end up messing with it. It's just going to be right all the time. It can be jammed, however. Yep, it can can be jammed. But um, if you're getting it and you're listening to it um, and you can hear what's going on, it, it's not likely it's going to be spoofed. Okay, so a while back, I had a friend that told me he had an atomic clock. Uh, he asked me how they get a, a nuclear reactor uh, <laughs> stuck in one of those small little atomic clocks. So I kind of explained um, uh, that this clock is really just a radio that's attached to your clock. The radio goes out and listens to a transmitter that is connected to a nuclear re uh, reactor. So, you know, atomic clocks, uh, it's not like you have your own little personal nuclear reactor. All of that comes across through with the RF out there. So let's talk about good old GMT, UTC, and Zulu time. So all time in, this, in, the, in our little earth is all referenced to one place in uh, England and that's called Greenwich. And that's referred to as Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, back when they came up with the original standards on how time was going to operate, where how we're gonna do time around the world. So when it came to navigating it, the world, we could have one set of charts and use one clock to figure out where they, we are. So we also developed a term called prime meridian. So that's zero degrees longitude. That's located in England and it starts and, and time starts at midnight every day. So that's the start of of time for a day. 
So there's the GMT is kind of an old concept, but built on top of that, uh, came up with the universal time uh, coordinated UTC. So this is actually a set of standards that was written that defined how world time was going to operate. Now in that definition, in that, in that set of standards, it still came back to GMT being the source and the reference of where time starts on earth. There's another um, uh, reference out there called uh, uh, C CUT, Coordinated Uni Universal Time. This is an older uh, set of, of standards that really means nothing more than UTC. So all three of these guys here, uh, GMT, uh, UTC, CUT, all re really reference the same place on Earth. It's just the UTC comes up with all the standards that we use on how how things work around the world. Yeah, the uh, the WWV voice announcements all uh, mention uh, coordinated universal time. Yep. So we also have Zulu time. So that's kind of an interesting time. So Zulu time is really a t uh, a tribe that lives in. Uh, the South in South Africa. So their time zone in that little kingdom there is a plus two. I don't know if you know anything about the Zulus, but they are probably the most fiercest warriors of anywhere in Africa. They actually clean their clock for um, when England, when Great Britain tried to uh, conquer much of Africa. The Zulus just basically beat the snot out of um, the English shop up there. So they're mostly known by, a, they wear a bright red, dark red robe, and they stand about seven feet tall. Excellent basketball players, or they should be excellent basketball players. But you know, it's still kind of surprising uh, standing next to these guys and talking to them. Uh, one of these guys got a cell phone call and he reached inside of his, uh, big uh, coat, red coat, pulled out a cell phone and had a conversation with them. So even the, even the Zulus are uh, bending their ways into uh, this modern world of using cell phones. Um, but of so, course, Zulu time has nothing to do with the Zulus. It has nothing to do with Zulus. So Zulu time <laughs> is actually a, a reference to zero time, um, Z time. So th um, that's, uh, and it's, I'm not sure how that name really came about, but it still stands for st stands for time zero, which is GMT. Which is uh, basically it's the uh, it's the phonetic alphabet Z. Yep. The the time zones around the Earth, uh, there are 24 of them. Uh, use uh, the phonetic uh, alphabet to designate which one is which. So, for instance, here in uh, the Pacific, in daylight savings time, we are in the Tango time zone, mm -hmm. and in Standard time, we are in the Uniform time zone. Mm -hmm. And uh, navigators uh, use uh, these uh, numbers uh, quite frequently when they're referring to uh, the time zone you're in. Hawaii is a whiskey time zone, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan, depending on the time of year, could be in the hotel time zone. Hmm. Know that. Very interesting. Well, let's talk about time zones. Okay, so as Bill said, is that the world is divided up into tw 24 time zones. So this has, what, what you're trying to accomplish is that a person, as they move around the world, um, they like to have a concept of what time is, you know, 12 noon to everybody should be the sun should be straight up in the air. So this is kind of a concept of trying to give everybody a concept of 12 noon. If you had a sundial, um, you don't want your sundial to always have to reference uh, GMT. You really want it to reference a local time and that's all based on where the sun is. So the earth is carved up into, uh, um, 
uh, 15 degree increments starting at GMT or starting at, at, yeah, at GMT time. Okay, each time zone is about 15 degrees. Uh, time zones are drawn on internal or international boundaries. Like you think about um, the US, we have four time zones and that's carved up on internal ways of doing things. If you think of Portugal over there, they fit very nicely in one time zone. So internationally, they have a time zone on both sides of them. Some, some countries like India and China, they don't bother with time zone. They use one time zone and that's it. Is Russia still 13 time zones? Russia has moved away from, uh, they still have the time zones, but they've moved away from uh, daylight savings time. Um, actually, Russia has, has been kind of a, a collection of various things where they're, the charts for how their Russian rail, railroad runs used to all run from Moscow time, all based on Moscow time. So you always had to convert your local time zone into Moscow time zone to figure out what time the train was going to show up in your city. The U.S. railroads were very uh, much a pioneer in, uh, and an impetus in getting time zones in the United States set up because uh, that way they could have uh, schedule, they could publish schedules that every little town would know precisely when the uh, train was coming through. Before yep. that, it was, you know, the podunk uh, noon was when the sun was directly overhead for them. And, 100 miles down the railroad to the west, uh, that would be uh, earlier in the day. So uh, yeah, the railroads really pushed to get the time zones uh, created in the United States. So Oregon is in time zone uh, minus seven. GMT right now. minus it's seven. Minus eight. Minus, eight. minus seven right now. Minus yeah. eight when we're in standard time. Excuse, okay. Which may never happen. I, Got that one wrong. I need to fix that one. So I'll fix that. Oh, there is so a then, little bit of Oregon that is in Mountain Time. That's true. <laughs> yep. So got, right now they're in minus six. Yep. Where's that? That's in Ontario. Yeah. And the surrounding area. Because they're they're closer to Boise. Mm. You know, they they uh, get the Boise TV channels and radio channels, so makes sense for them to be in uh, Victor time. Okay, so anyway, I, I messed that one up. So we'll have to make some adjustments on a couple other more slides. So there's also a concept of the international date, date line. So um, serves as a line between two consecutive calendar dates. So, and it's out in the Pacific Ocean. And so on, uh, and so if you think of of GMT Greenwich being on a circle um, zero degrees, the opposite side of the earth is 180 degrees. So that's where that international time zone is. <laughs> there are a couple of jogs in that though. There is. Yep. And with, there's nothing perfect on any time zone, <laughs> international date line, nothing is a perfect line. They all have their own little jogs in it. So <clears throat> when we think about GMT time, when we move to the West, those time zones are gonna <clears throat> increment in a positive direction up to, through uh, 12 different time zones. From GMT, from Greenwich there, if we move in the easterly direction, the time zones are gonna be moving in a negative direction. So uh, cor again, correction on that bottom slide there, it should read Oregon is in uh, a minus eight. So we're actually moving eastward from Greenwich time. So here's a couple of little charts. The one on the left there. <coughs> showing actually, the that's reversed. Yes. Uh, my, if, if you're, we are west of Greenwich. Yeah. Excuse me, did I get that backwards? You got it backwards, yeah. Okay, yep, 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 you're right. You yep, gotta watch out, Mike. No, I'm, 
I have yeah. to say, I did not go back through and proofread this guy. So. You got the wrong audience, Mike. <laughs> no, no, I don't. I have the right audience. I, Bill, I need this Bill's stuff all picked excited up. because he's going to be recalled to active duty in 10 million years to reset the clock one second. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so here... Here we have on the left here, we have the globe here. We showed where the prime meridian is. That's Greenwich Mean Time, how it cuts through the earth. The guy over on the right, <clears throat> that's the international date line. And it shows that that doesn't really follow a straight line going down. It jogs around a little bit. There's actually more jogs than what's being showed there. Here's a question for you. What's the What's the earliest time zone in the, in uh, America? In the Americas. In the continent of the U.S.? No, I didn't say Oh, in the Atlantic. Atlantic. Okay. No. The, okay earliest, so that... the earliest is Guam. It's actually Ooh. in plus 12 time zone. Oh, that was just right. across the international date. Yeah. yeah. Huh. What about the Aleutian Islands? Uh, yeah, Guam's always a day ahead of us. Huh. Interesting. So here's here's a, a map that kind of shows the time zone. So you can look here in the U.S. and you can actually see exactly where I blew it there where uh, UTC minus 8 should be the Pacific uh, side of uh, the U.S. Uh, you can also see the time zones. Uh, boy, think of um, of Russia there. You can see all the different time zones all the way across it. And then you have India there. So that's all one time zone. It looks like they cross probably three, four, four different time zones. Uh, China is only one time zone. India is uh, just one time zone. It doesn't look like a big deal for them, but China is, it would be a big deal. Yeah, Russia and the British Empire could always say the sun never set. Hmm. Yeah. Yep, that's probably about right. You notice that big jog to the west uh, on Greenwich uh, time for Iceland? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. The reason for that is that Iceland is so far north and the hours of daylight yeah. are so screwy. <laughs> Anywhere from you know two hours of daylight to 23 hours of daylight. Uh, they just said, eh, the heck with it. We'll just stay with uh, Greenwich. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it doesn't make any sense for them because they are, are that far north that um, it really doesn't make any big, big deal as far as uh, they could just easily stay with Greenwich and be just fine with it. So let's look at DST, Daylight Savings Time. <clears throat> so this is an interesting phenomena here. So the EU, US, New Zealand, Chile, some of Australia uh, still use DST, Daylight Savings Time. Countries around the equator don't use, don't bother with DST. Why is that, Bill? Well, because the sun comes up and goes down pretty much the same time every day. Mm -hmm. They have a 12 hour day, yeah. sun they have 12 hours in sun, they have 12 hours at night, and it happens all the, pretty much the same time every single day. So there's no need for it. Well, around the world, uh, in the Northern hemisphere, it's most, it, except here in Canada, it's uh, called summertime. And in the south of the equator, when we go on summertime, they go on wintertime, not exactly the same. It's not exact coordination, but the, the terms are uh, similar. Australia is on summertime uh, when we're uh, in daylight, when we have no daylight time. So I lived in Ecuador for five years, and uh, the seasons vary about half an hour over the, over the, the year. And uh, wintertime, which is wintertime here, but it's the hot season. Summertime is the cool season. Hmm. Yep. So, so daylight savings time is, is kind of been slowly falling out of uh, favor by a lot of countries. Uh, Russia has scrapped it, so that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and they're kind of a northern country. Uh, and then more and more places are kind of falling, you know, throwing it away. 
So I know Oregon has kind of talked or has voted to scrap it. And I think Washington, we're waiting on California to, to scrap the concept of daylight savings time. We really don't like it. So my numbers there are kind of screwed up. So if we scrap daylight savings time and we actually stay always in daylight savings time, then what kind of GMT are we really, What which of the GMTs are we really going to be in? Minus seven. Minus seven. Minus seven. But, but, uh, but Mike, uh, they're, they're, they're going to keep daylight savings time for all, all permanently. That's the whole point. Yeah, we'll always be in daylight savings time. So you said scrapping daylight savings well, time. Well, it's, okay, scrapping the concept of daylight savings not time. Not switching. Not switching. You mean switching back and forth. We are not, yeah, we would not switch back and forth. They're going to scrap standard, standard time. Standard time, shouldn't yeah. be. Okay, that's all like that. That's the better one. Scrap uh, standard time. But why scrap standard time when there's a world standard? We should scrap changing and stay on the world standard time. I agree oh. with that. Yeah. Well, what happens with Arizona? Arizona's not on, uh, isn't it? Well, uh, daylight savings time. No. They don't, they don't want more uh, days of, uh, you know, longer days in the summertime. So, right. I knew this would bring up a good discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm personally for well, standard you know, time, not, not daylight. Not Arizona is pretty far south anyway, so their uh, annual variation isn't as, nearly as great as ours is. That's right. Well, I think if we change the daylight savings time permanently, we will call it standard time. That's right. D PDT. Uh, instead of PDT, we have PST. Yeah. <laughs> And you won't even know that the generations won't even know the difference. There won't be any distinction. Well, uh, you know, I, 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 I've already built up a sleep deficit since Sunday. So, you know, I, I just assume not change ever again. Yeah. Hey, we're yeah. hams. The new day starts at 0001 <laughs> GMT. <laughs> yep. Well, it's four o'clock in the afternoon. So anyway, I thought that that'd be a, that's a good point as far as if we get rid of our, um, uh, our anyway, we, we stop mucking with our darn time and we just leave it in one place all the time. Yeah. Stupid. Yep. Okay. That, that begs the question though, you know, all these uh, consumer atomic clock, you know, how will they know to deal with, oh, this is the West Coast, so they don't switch. I don't know that was kind of my question when you were talking about the clocks. A lot of them have a, a user controllable setting to switch or to disable the daylight switch. That that occurred to me. I'm not sure mine does or not. But my, my atomic clock, which is fairly old, uh, well, the one in the living room, and it um, it detects uh, daylight savings time because of that bit that's sent out uh, by a WWV. Yeah, you have to have a way to tell it to ignore that bit. Because like, if you lived in Arizona now, you'd need that. Yeah, a lot of times there's adjustments. There's, there's a, a configuration that says, adjust for DST. And yet that was something you could turn on or turn off um, for on those atomic clocks. Remember these consumer devices are sold all over the world to lots of places that don't do that. Yep. A lot of these US clocks will only give you the choice of four time zones. They, yeah. don't, they don't let you set any, and they're, they're hard coded to WWVB. So there may be some things that get broken if that happens, and you may end up having to upgrade to something newer. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, as a ham, um, why is time so important, and how do we how do we deal with time? So when we enter uh, a contact into our log, so we just completed a QSO, we just worked some rare DX station, we enter that. QSO into our log, the time that goes into uh, that log is, is, is expressed in UTC time. Um, so in other words, all of every log, every entry that we put into in there is always UTC time and, and date. So 
whenever we want to look at things and look at it expressed in our particular time zone, one of the things that we usually set up in a logging system is that we set up our local time zone. And all that will, or we may not, because some pieces of software looks on our computer and our computer actually tells it what time zone it is and if DST is being applied or not. But visually it's giving us a different view of what the local time is as opposed to when that log entry got put in there. So why is it that we want that log entry to represent uh, UTC and not local time? So everybody's on the same on the same time standard. Yeah, it's consistent around the world. Yeah. It's consistent around the world. Is that if I talk to a guy in Russia, and I want to match log entries, I don't want to have to go through there and do conversions between his time zone, my time zone, to see if the darn thing matches. If it uses UTC time, it's a one world time zone. So that time-wise, <clears throat> his entry into the, lo into the log, my entry into the log are going to be the same thing. So that's especially important like when you get into like log book of the world, all of those entries are always made in UT UTC time. So another thing is that, uh, actually here's another little, little thing that kind of interesting. We think about, well, it's novel for hams. When you get into doing banking transactions and international tra transactions, all of those transactions are flowing through databases and throwing through uh, network instruments. All of those things, the timestamps on when those transactions happen are all UTC time. I, a long while back, I was working on a project where I, I was collecting a bunch of information from a lot of different places and shoving it into a database. The guys in the database, they had a con concept of they just dealt with local time. I collected everything in UTC time. We had this huge, huge knockdown drag out fight about them not understanding that this information is coming from a lot of different places all at the same time. And I need to track the information as if it happened all at one time, not from different local places. So uh, they fought, fought me for two, almost three years. And finally they said, you're right. And they decided to con convert everything over to UTC time. So I, I won that battle. So think about that, all of our financials, all of our stuff that flows around the world. How does airlines deal with the difference between different times? When I book a flight, when it leaves, it's gonna be booked at, um, uh, at UTC time. When it gets displayed to me, as far as when I get to board things, it's gonna be displayed to me as local time. So uh, when Ham schedule a DX contact, um, so that schedule, it, you know, if you're doing DX, you're gonna share that information in UTC time. It's always gonna be UTC time because, and then so I have to end up saying, okay, I'm gonna meet this guy at um, four o'clock UTC time. I end up having to convert that to what my local time is. So you just learn what that offset is as far as number of hours and you learn to add it to the you know 24 hour clock and then Zippo you're you're there uh, you're you're there when you're supposed to be for that contact. Uh, start and stop times for contests. When we deal with an inter any international contest, what are they always expressed in? They are always expressed in UTC time so everybody has one common time reference on when a contest starts and when a contest stops. I think everybody's probably in this group here has um, has seen that and understand what, I, what we're talking about. So here's a couple, some other interesting facts here as we finish up with things. How fast does RF travel? RF travels, um, 
and kill that. <clears throat> um, so radio waves travels through a vacuum at 186,000 uh, miles per second. Um, have you ever heard your echo from RF going around the world? So I don't know if you've ever tried calling CQ. When you finish your uh, calling your CQ, you um, turn your receiver back on and you hear the tail end of you calling CQ coming back around the world. Uh, so it actually takes uh, a little bit of time for that to end up happening. I think it's about uh, is it about a quarter of a second or something like that that you end up hearing the time. Um, distance from Earth to Moon is around um, 328,000 miles. It takes about two and a half seconds for a round trip. So if I'm doing EME work, I send something to the moon, it bounces off the moon, it gets back to the earth two and a half seconds later. So that means the person receiving it, once he receives it, he has to um, uh, decode it and send a response, which again, when he sends that response is gonna delay getting back to me two and a half seconds. So that means all those EME protocols still have to deal with that round trip delay. So you're not going to get things turned around going back and forth between the, the, uh, the moon very fast. Okay, it takes about, 50, about 13 minutes, 45 seconds for radio waves to travel from Mars back to Earth. And that depends. That's a kind of a fluid thing because our rotation around the sun varies our distance between Mars and Earth. So I think everybody's probably heard the, the horror stories about the 11 minutes of terror when they were trying to put that last rover on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on Mars uh, surface there. And that there were 13 minutes where the rover, all that equipment had to do things autonomously to get that thing onto the earth. So they didn't know for, for excuse me, for 11 minutes unless they didn't know, know if the guys actually made it onto the earth or not, or onto the planet correctly. So it's pretty cool about, you know, we, we did talk about how fast RF gets around the planet, but when we get out of our terrestrial um, earth, um, it takes time for RF to get around there. By the way, that thing, uh, uh, time to Mars, that's when Mars is on the other side of the sun from us. Uh, it can uh, be much less than that when they're on this side, when they're near us. Yep. Yeah, I, th I think that 13 minutes was supposed to be an average. It gets much worse if it's further away and much less if it's closer. So I think that was supposed to, be, I think I picked an average of what that was. Well, so the sun is, it, it takes, uh, you know, a photon from the sun about eight minutes to get to the earth. And ah. so. Okay. So it has to be probably 16 minutes for the maximum amount. Um, okay. So let's think about uh, time and other things. So programs like uh, WSJT, uh, the protocols like uh, JT65, FT8, requires your computers to be synchronized to less than one second, so the GMT. So we've all run into trying to get our computers synchronized. Most computers, if you have access to the internet, um, has a protocol called uh, NTP, Network Time Protocol, and they synchronize to the Bureau of Standards. You have these servers out there that serve up correct time. and this protocol is made to work with delays in the network and figure out how to properly adjust uh, time. And actually they do an averaging on how the, uh, the flight of time between sending out a request and getting a response back. So uh, another one, uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. I guess another thing that we always think about for in hams, we know that for audio, that audio spectrum really gets can get sliced up in time. So our audio that we normally use, like for HF, 
is usually about uh, 2.7 kilohertz wide. So a kilohertz is a measurement of time. When we measure RF, it's also measured in time. So the reciprocal of time is called milliseconds. And, and so those are both measurements that we constantly, constantly use as being a ham radio. Our PC, the CPU that we use in there, and when we access the internet, our CPU is always expressed in these days in gigahertz as far as how fast it runs. That's an expression of time. We also know that our internet, we normally express that in um, MBS, um, and that actually should be a small b, it should be M, small bs. So that stands for megabits per second. So when you see things out there, I keep seeing things getting mixed up between M, small b, s, and M, capital B, p, s. What's the difference between those two different nomenclatures? Bits and bytes. Bits and bytes, that's right. Big B stands for bytes. So remember that when you talk about bytes, that's a collection of, you, generally it's eight bits worth of information. So um, you, you have to watch when you're, how you're talking about that and see how things get scaled. So time synchronization, we talked about um, using WWVB for synchronizing our clocks. We've talked about network time protocol and we really haven't brought in GPS for synchronizing computer clocks. So uh, I'm kind of wondering if, if for any reason WWV goes away, I think we're gonna be seeing more clocks that are gonna start putting in GPS systems to be able to do the synchronization for that. So that's probably how things are going to go in the future if we lose WWV. Um, so if we do synchronization from GPSs, what do we have for accuracy on that? Generally, a GPS has accuracy in around the 10, 10 nanoseconds uh, area. So that's a billionth of a second. But in that GPS system, to try and measure the accuracy, and you know that GPS to measure where something is on the earth, you know where those GPS transmitters are up in the heavens. You physically, you know where they are. And what you do, you do use triangulation. You need a three, you need to be hearing at least three different GPS transmitters to be able to triangulate where you are on earth. But that 10 nanoseconds worth of variation still only gives you 15 meters of accuracy on trying to triangulate something here on the earth. The more GPS receivers you get, the better that accuracy becomes. So we also, I don't know if, um, I see more and more guys that um, on better receivers like flex radios and some of the higher end radios, they actually have the ability to synchronize to a GPS uh, a transceiver. So they can bring in that GPS signal and use that to synchronize their VFOs in their transceivers and where they can get um, half cycle uh, accuracies out of that. Matter of fact, there's also a contest, ARL contest, to tell so people can look at a transmitter and determine what frequency that transmitter is on and these guys are down splitting straws on half cycles, quarter cycle accuracy on telling uh, what the, uh, that transmitter is actually transmitting on, what frequency it's transmitting on. So it's pretty cool. Um, we also have high quality um, instruments for measuring time. Um, we have lots of, in, electro, in the electronic world, we have oscilloscopes, we have spectrum analyzers, we've got all kinds of electronic devices that do require uh, calibration. So there's a whole uh, hierarchy of what the re master references, what the instruments get calibrated for, those, what those, cal those calibrated instruments are used to calibrate 
are um, instruments that we use in electronics. So there's a whole bunch of, uh, there's a whole process of how that, that calibration process works. So here's one that is gonna kind of twist your mind. This is kind of at the, uh, this is the end of the, my presentation here. So Albert Einstein's had a theorized that space and time are intertwined. They're, 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 they're mixed together. So gravity distorts space. As space gets distorted, it also distorts time. So that's an interesting concept because we all know what gravity is. That's what keeps us stuck here on this earth here. And, but as that gravity changes, it can distort our time. Kind of weird. Okay, as the forces of gravity increases at a given location, time slows down at that location. The good old National uh, Institute of Standards there, um, they've actually started looking at this and they're tr trying to figure out right now how to apply gravity to adjust the output of their atomic clock because that gravity on, can change what really what real time is based on where they're located you know, the problem is is that you know using gps we're not very accurate with that and to actually do the proper adjustments on adjusting how that gravity affects time we need to have accuracy plus or minus a, a centimeter so that's you know half an inch accuracy and at this point in time, we have no way of calculating things that close to where things are on Earth to make any kind of adjustments on time. How do you like that one for a thought, thought provoker? So as a summary, really simple. The modern world could not exist without knowing the precise time. We've gotten through a lot of different things on what our world runs on and how our world works and what we at ham radio operators use um, day in and day out. And we don't think twice about those concepts. But if it wasn't for guys like Galileo and some of the initial computations that he worked on, um, and if we didn't have those things today, we wouldn't have anything close to what we have for time and modern society that we use today would just not exist if we didn't have that. Any thoughts or other questions? That's the end of the program. Another great presentation, Mike. Yeah. I think that it was really very nice, very nice. So so I'm sorry about some of those uh, typos there. Um, this was the first time run through and I didn't get a time to uh, uh, time to proof it. So I, uh, those are, I appreciate the uh, input on all that.